Okay, welcome to the last session today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Gagnon, who will speak about matrix clustering and completion. Please. Thank you for the introduction. So this is joint work with a few of my colleagues and co-authors, mostly, well, mainly Eduard, who is here, Iyad, Sebastian, and Stefan, who all sent their guides, but they are not here. And I will be speaking about some problems which are actually not defined on graphs, uh, which, you know, maybe is interesting, but graphs will pop up. You will see that graphs somehow have a tendency of appearing in these problems. So what, what are these problems? What problems are I going to be speaking about? Well, the main problem I'm interested in within this talk is matrix completion. So there, our input is a matrix over some general field, let's say numbers, modulus, and prime p, and some entries in this matrix are simply missing, they're gone. We don't know these entries. And as the name suggests, we want to complete the matrix, so we want to fill in all these missing entries, these red stars, um, in a way which minimizes some measure, right? These measures, there's various studied options, and in general, the idea is you want to exploit some, some similarity between the rows of the matrix, right? So that's our general goal. I want to just very briefly speak about previous work we did on this topic before I move on to more recent results which might also be more interesting for this workshop because the more recent ones use kernelization. But I still think I should quickly introduce what we did before. So um, we considered two measures in our previous work. One of them was we wanted to minimize the rank of the matrix, right? So the size of a basis. Um, for instance, here you could fill in this matrix, complete the matrix in this way, and then you could get a basis of size 3, right? Another option, reasonable option that we considered was that we wanted to fill in the entries so that we minimize the number of different rows or unique rows that occur in that matrix. So here is an option of doing that where you could make these two rows identical. So these are two well-defined problems, rank, rank matrix completion and distinct row matrix completion. Okay, we looked at the complexity of these things. Um, why did we do that? Well, these things are, these problems are quite well studied, just in different fields. I think in Panos complexity, they're not, they're not like fundamental, but in other fields, they're very well known. There's connections to the Netflix problem, to some triangulation from incomplete data, and so forth. In some settings, your dimension, your, your domain size, so the numbers that occur, are bounded by some constant, or you can assume that they are bounded by some constant. In other settings, your numbers could be large. And we wanted, in our initial work, we looked at both cases, right? So to distinguish this, we looked at rank matrix completion and distinct row matrix completion, either with P in front of the name, as is usual, this means that P is fixed, or just the standard versions where there is no bound on P, it's just part of the input. So we have four problems here. But the rank is over a finite field, or? It's always over, over a finite field, it's just a question whether it's a part of the input or fixed to be like five or three or a constant. Not like complex or real number. It's like a difference between coloring and three coloring. Oh, these are just uh, integers. Like, uh, not wheels, not wheels. Just, uh, you can assume it's uh, rationals, for instance. But, but, but rank is also, you take a rank over operations in a finite field, not over integers or reals. Like over a finite field, yes, over a finite field. But the field is not fixed. It's the, the size of the field is given as part of the input. Okay. Oh, here it's fixed. Okay, so the parameters we consider, well, the, the most f basic thing you will think about is, well, let's just parameterize by number of missing entries. But this is very restrictive, right? Like, in, in usually, you will have many missing entries and just consider the case where a few of them are missing, it feels very restrictive. So what we did instead was, we looked at the number of rows where the missing entries were occurring, right? So this kind of can be motivated because if your parameter is small, this means you have only a few rows where you don't know some stuff. So this is like in the, this Netflix setting, uh, you have a few new users added to your database for which you don't know everything, but for all other users, you know everything. You can do the same thing for columns. So you just parameterize by number of columns where there are question marks, right? Where there are missing entries. And you can do something that's even better than both of these options. You can just parameterize by number of columns and rows, which together cover all the missing entries. Here is two, right? So this is strictly, uh, strictly better parameter. Right? And later on, we'll only be using this, but in our initial work, we considered all three. Um, so I want to ask just a question, just your intuition. What do you think is harder, filling in the entries to minimize the rank or filling in the entries to minimize the number of distinct rows? So who thinks that rank minimization is harder? Please raise your hand. I, I also 
think so, kind of, thought so. Who thinks that uh, distinct dual matrix completion is harder? Okay. So we are all right, it depends on the parameter. We will see soon. So in, in, in if you have the bounded domain uh, case, everything is FPT, which is good. Here you have some randomized, so this is randomized FPT, but okay, good enough. All of this is FPT, I'm happy with that. But once you move on to the case where the domains are not fixed, but are part of the input, uh, here you see some distinction. In particular, we don't know whether this is FPT or not. We just have an XP algorithm for rank matrix completion. But for this thing, dual matrix completion, we got FPT. I I'll just very briefly sketch how we did this. This is kind of, yeah. But once you look at other parameters than number of rows, like number of columns or even the covering number, uh, here you get power NP hardness. So NP hardness for a fixed value of the parameter. So yeah, depending on your parameter, either this is harder or this is harder. You can make choose. I was quite surprised. I, yeah. Um, Okay, so I want to very quickly just sketch how one gets these results, very, very quickly, because I want to move on to the clustering part. So for this thing, draw matrix completion, what actually turns out to happen, well, you can draw a graph where the rows are gonna be your vertices, and you make edges between vertices if and only if the rows can be made to be, you know, like the same, because of the missing entries. So like here, you could represent this matrix as this graph, and the funny thing is, this distinct dual matrix completion is like finding a clique partitioning in the graph. Yeah? It's just not a difficult observation. Um, and you know, if your graph is small tree width, we can solve this clique partitioning problem efficiently, a FPT algorithm. And whenever in the bounded domain case, if any of your parameters are bounded, we show that the tree width is bounded. And in the unbounded domain case, if the number of rows is bounded, we also show that the tree width is bounded. It basically becomes an instance of vertex cover K. And the other two cases, tree width is not bounded, then we show hardness. That's just a very quick rundown. As I said, I don't want to give, give many details here. For the rank minimization, you can assume your instance looks like this, right? You have, let's say you parameterize by the covering number. So your parameter is the number of rows plus the number of columns, which contain all the question marks, so all the missing entries. And we can just you know, shuffle the rows and columns as we like, so we can just assume they appear at the top and at the right. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we're gonna just do basic branching to guess how, which of the rows are independent and which of them are going to be dependent after completion, right? So a basis is basically just a set of independent rows, so we're guessing which of them are going to be part of the basis. Um, we're also going to branch to decide how the dependent rows depend on the independent ones, so like what kind of coefficients are needed. Okay, and we will also do the same for columns, but I'm gonna ignore that part here. I'm just gonna explain what happens for rows. And then in each branch, we just need to verify whether our guess, for each guess, we need to verify whether this is actually realistic, whether our branching, whether we can make all of this stuff dependent, right? And this boils down, if you really think about it, this just boils down to a set of linear or quadratic equations. So here, you need to make sure that like this row can be obtained as a linear combination of these independent rows plus the stuff below, right? And this means for each element here, you need to make sure that you can obtain as a linear combination of this stuff and this stuff. And these are just linear equations because there's no question marks below, but you don't know the dependency coefficients. And here you know the dependency coefficients, but you don't know the question marks. You don't know the missing end. The only thing is here in this last column, you get quadratic equations, which is bad. They are hard to solve. But there's only a small number of these quadratic equations because the number of columns is bounded, and so this part is bounded. And since the number of quadratic equations is bounded, we found some black box result which allowed us to solve the system with only very few quadratic equations. Okay, good. So this was just, how much time did I spend on this? Very little, that's good. And I want, yes? No, there's a big clock over there. Ah, yes, that's much better, thank you. Uh, very good, not much time. So I didn't want to speak much about this. What I want to speak about is another way, a different, newer way, or not newer, but a different way of looking at matrix completion. Um, let's just take a step back and assume we ourselves as human beings want to solve this instance of matrix completion. Right? So we have rows, our users, and columns are like things they like or don't like. Imagine they are like individual movies or products or whatever. Um, so after thinking a bit, I, I think you can observe that like each user has some preferences. Some users don't seem to like 
the first five items, but do like the last five items, mostly with some noise. And some other users, they like the first five items, but don't like the last five items. Right? And this is very natural because people tend to have preferences in terms of like movie genres or types of products and so forth. Um, so we probably want to complete this to match this observation, right? So I personally would probably put this full of ones and this full of zeros because I think this guy is more likely to like all of the left side and not like the right side. Yeah? And this intuition is not captured by distinct row matrix completion or rank matrix completion. This, to, to capture this intuition, what you want to do is you want to cluster your matrix into a small number of, uh, basically a small number of clusters. Um, so basically, to capture this, what we want to do is complete the matrix in a way so that after completing it, you do get a good clustering. Yeah. Um, so to formalize the problem, you again get an incomplete matrix, but now I'm going to be only speaking about Boolean matrices. Uh, the thing is, we know how to extend it to fixed domain. It's just technical, but I'm not going to speak about it here. Uh, but for unbounded domain, we don't know anything. We didn't even consider that. It's what's hard enough for Boolean. Um, what you get as part of your input is the number of clusters you want to get after you do the completion. So maybe two, three, or five. And you want some measure which says how, um, how let's say, tight the clusters can be. Some distance measure which tells you how wide the clusters can be. Um, and finally, you will later see we will need something to bound the occurrence of these missing entries we're going to use this cover number that I already introduced. So the number of rows and columns you need to cover all the missing entries. OK, and the task is going to be to just complete the matrix so that you get a good clustering, whatever this good clustering means. And there are three natural options of what you could mean by clustering, maybe more. But here I'm going to look at three options that I, at least we consider natural and have been studied in the literature. So one of them we call in-clustering. So what does this mean? Well, what does this mean? You want to partition your rows into k clusters. And each cluster consists of rows which have Hamming distance at most r from some center that lies inside that cluster. So it is an actual row there. Now, so each of these clusters have some guy that himself, considers himself the center. Then there's any clustering, which is the same, but your centers could be anything. They could be any vector you choose. They don't have to be uh, someone in your instance. And finally, pairwise clustering or pair clustering, we don't have any centers. We just want the pairwise distances to be at most i. So I personally think all three of these definitions make sense. So we just looked at all three. They have all three been studied. Um, and we'll see the techniques are going to apply to all three with some minor modifications. OK, so here's an example, just so you get some feeling for these three notions. So this is the same instance from before. If I want to do any clustering, what I can do is just fill in these things full of ones. The first, the first three get, get ones. The next three get zeros. And now the centers for our two clusters are the dark green and dark orange. And the clusters themselves are like yellow and green, or orange and green. And we get R2, K2. For in-clustering, you need to increase your R to capture this, because you cannot choose a good center, a center that you would like for the orange part. So you need to choose this row at the very top, or vector at the very top. And so you need slightly bigger R. And for pairwise clustering, you get also R equal to 3, because the distance between this row and this row is simply 3. It's just some intuition building. But in all three cases, it makes sense to fill in these entries roughly like this. It's not the only way of doing that, but one of the many reasonable ways. OK, so the first obstacle, we want, we want to get some you know, Pallet complexity results. Our aim was actually to get FPT. It just happened to be that the way we showed it was via kernelization. Uh, we don't have any other way of showing that. It's not, but somehow kernelization worked. Um, our first ob obstacle was, you know, in the previous problems, when you have no missing entries, these things are kind of trivial, right? Like if you want to compute the rank of a matrix or you want to compute the number of unique rows in a matrix, uh, this is polytime. But here, if you just want to cluster a matrix, this is NP hard, even, even under very strong restrictions, right? Um, 
But we looked at some parameters, right? So we need to solve clustering to even touch completion. We need to solve clustering first. Otherwise, we have no hope. Um, but luckily, both k as the number of clusters you want and r as the like, distance inside the clusters are reasonable and well-motivated parameters. So we started with those. Um, and taking these parameters on their own doesn't help. You still get hardness. OK, for in clustering, you get W2 completeness because you get the trivial XP algorithm by just guessing the centers. But it's not really interesting, right? Um, but you don't get FPT. But what we do show is if you take both parameters together, so number of clusters and the desired ra radius, you actually do get FPT algorithms for these. Um, I want to now say something with, risk, with regards to a different characterization of this problem. You know, this problem can be characterized in, in there is an equivalent characterization of the problem in terms of graphs on a special graph class. So if you consider this in clustering, where you want to find these clusterings uh, with, uh, with centers in your instance, uh, this is the same as just finding a dominating set of size k inside uh, induced subgraphs of r powers of hypercubes. So uh, like how you build this hypercube is from your instance of matrix, uh, of matrix uh, clustering. Basically, your vectors are going to tell you which vertices occur in the hypercube. And the rh power corresponds to the distances that you are allowed to cover or cluster into. And then you delete basically the vertices which do not occur in your instance. Right? So this is really just dominating set on this interest or strange graph class. And this pairwise clustering, this is just clique partition on the same graph class. So if you prefer thinking about graphs, this is, a, this is an equivalent way. It just doesn't translate well once you want to do completion. Then you kind of lose this, uh, this equivalent view. And for any clustering, it also gets messy. But at least for these two problems, you can think of them as graph problems. Um, OK, that was just a quick intermezzo. Um, what about completion? Here I just speak about clustering, but our aim was to do completion, right? So for completion, uh, this is some notation that we use for completion with these missing entries. Uh, if you just parameterize by k plus r, I guess this is not surprising. You still get NP completeness, even for fixed k and r, because you have no control over the missing entries. So if you don't control the missing entries, it becomes extremely hard. But if you add this covering number here as your, into your parameters, you get FPT here as well. Right? And the, the techniques we used here to show FPT for clustering kind of translate with some minor modifications to the case when we want to do completion to clustering with covers and extra parameter. OK, for the rest of the talk, I just want to give you some ideas of how these proofs work. That's my main goal. Now. Um, so let's first start with the case where there are no missing entries. We're just doing clustering. This means that the covering number is zero. Yeah? And let's look at an arbitrary vertex or vector, or an arbitrary row or vector. V, right? I kind of interchange vector and rows. So it's the same thing. Um, and now let's look at all other vectors at having distance exactly t from v. And this t is going to be at most 2 times r. So t is bounded by the parameter. Um, so let's look at those. And I'm now going to visualize them a little bit. So I'm going to imagine, basically, all my coordinates laying in a plane. So these are all coordinates that occur in my instance. So this means like all columns that occur in my instance, p1, p2, and so forth. And all of these vectors that are at distance t from v, well, I can represent them as basically a set of size t, which, where the set tells me in which coordinates this vector differs from v. So here, u1 differs from my initial vector v uh, in coordinates 1, 2, and 5. Okay. So this set system, all sets there have size exactly t, which is good. And it's a set system. So what do I know about set, set systems? Well, not so much. But I, I do know that if this set system is very, very, very large, I can apply the sunflower lever, which kind of helps me get some nice structure in this, helps in this set system. So assuming this, the number of the neighbors of v is very large at this distance t, I can apply the sunflower lemma, and I can assume that there is some sunflower there with some core, p2, p5, and some petals, let's say, these petals. Uh, so let's look at this sunflower now. Now, and let's consider just what the solution would look like for in or any clustering. This means there must be some vector um, or row z that 
kind of dominates or covers, so it's basically a center for a cluster for a big part of S. So S is my sunflower and it's sufficiently large so that, so that there must be, because I have only k clusters, some cluster must cover a large part of this sunflower. Now, the interesting, is, the interesting thing is that cannot differ from V in too many coordinates, because if it's too far from V, it's also too far from everything in the sunflower. Right? It cannot be too far from V. So that is kind of only, if I draw it in the set system, it's only hitting roughly 3R, at most 3R coordinates. But this means all except at most 3R vectors in, in S are kind of they have a uniform intersection with Z. So they, they are at a uniform distance from Z, and Z covers more than 3R vectors in S. So Z is close enough to at least one petal that kind of has the same distance to Z as all other petals, or has the maximum distance to Z. Right? But based on this, I can now, it's now clear, I, I hope it's clear, that Z can be used to cover the whole sunflower, like if Z is close enough to P4, it must also be close enough to P7, P3, and all other sets in my set system. Right? Okay, well, now what happens, based on this observation, what would happen if I just deleted some petal, some element, U, from my sunflower? Well, obviously if you had a clustering before, you still have a clustering. Well, uh, there is some technicality there, I'll speak about it soon, but let's just assume this is true. And what we showed is that if you have a vector set that covers S minus U and this S is big enough, it must also cover all of S. Deleting one petal will not change the outcome. Um, so this means we can reduce the T neighborhood of any vector V to some function of R and K. This is basically the same argument as for the dominating course, right? So there is some strong intersection there. Uh, for in-clustering, we, we might be forgetting some important center, right? Because if you just delete this U, you cannot use it as a center anymore. Uh, let me just sweep this under the rug and say, once we get a small core like this, once we get a, the number of rows is small, we can always add back some exponential number, exponential in, in R and K, of potential centers which is sufficient to deal with this. Yeah, so just ignore this issue and just assume it's fine to delete these set systems. Okay, I want to say quickly how this works for pair clustering. So I showed you for in and any, okay, for in you have to believe me, but for any I showed you the full argument why deleting a petal is fine, deleting something from my sunflower is okay. Um, here the argument is similar. So here because the sunflower is so large, at least one cluster must contain many sets in the sunflower. Well, if this sunflower doesn't contain anything outside of S, then I can easily just add the whole sunflower because the pairwise distances are always the same. But if the sunflower does contain some Z outside of S, again, if I choose Z to be of maximum distance from some petal inside that cluster, anyway, it cannot hit more than three R petals, and so it has uniform distance to almost all petals in the sunflower, and I can once again assume the whole sunflower can go into this cluster. Right? Basically what I'm showing is if the sunflower is large enough, we can assume that it's covered by a single cluster, and then deleting one petal from the sunflower doesn't change anything. Okay, okay so let's just continue the argument um, by assuming that there are no missing entries. So we want to we'll apply this reduction step to bound the total neighborhood of every vector v, and now if you have a yes instance, look at that arbitrary cluster in this yes instance, pick an arbitrary vector or row in that cluster, this thing, this big ball of two, size 2r, has bounded size after we finish our reduction rule. Well, but this means um, the num if the number of rows is too large, we can reject. You cannot cover it all with clusters, right? Okay, that's good. So we, we kind of show that you can reduce the number of rows to some function of R and K. I'm a little bit low on time. How much time do I have? Like five minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you want to do completion, because so far I was just speaking about clustering. If you want to do completion, well, I'll just quickly go over this. If you have 
what you do have is a few rows R and a few columns C, where the columns C contain all the missing entries and rows R also, like these two things together contain all missing entries. Um, th there's only a few rows R, so I'm gonna just keep them in my kind of reduced instance. It's just k extra rows, that's fine. I'm reducing number of rows. For columns, I'm just gonna use them to partition basically have a more fine-grained look at my sunflowers. So when I do the same argument with sunflowers, I'm just going to look at the, at the case where my neighborhood of V is so large that even among uh, vectors with the same projection onto this column C, you still get a big sunflower. And once you know that all of these guys have the same projection to this vector C, the same argument goes true, and you can assume they're all in the same cluster. Okay, good. So, so far we could reduce the number of rows. This worked fairly well. The question is whether we are done. Well, actually not really because we still have many columns and still many missing entries. So for the next step, we need to reduce the number of columns. Um, here what you can show is that if you, again, ignore all rows in R and columns in C, so assume cover is zero, and consider this notion called the diameter. So the diameter is just the maximum Hamming distance between two rows in the instance. And we would like to show that the diameter in yes instances is bounded by some function of k and r. This is what I would like to show, that's the intuition. It's not true, right? Like here's a counter example. You can have a row full of zeros, a row full of ones. There is no bound on this, on the diameter here. So why do I want to say something like this? This is not true. But the intuition is if two rows are very far apart, they cannot interact. So to make this right, what we do is we have to look a little bit deeper. We define something called an interaction graph where vertices are rows and edges connect rows which have Hamming distance at most 2R. Again, we're ignoring this R and C. Um, if the number of components in this graph is too large, it's a no instance because these components now cannot interact. A cluster can only cover rows in one component in this graph because the edges kind of connect things which could interact. Um, and now if you consider basically two vectors, you can show that if you have a shortest part in, in the graph, this part is only going to contain at the most two vertices from each cluster. Otherwise, I can shorten the part. Right? If you have a part which goes through three or four clusters, I can just take the first and last element from that cluster and go directly through there because every cluster becomes a clique in this graph. Okay, but because of this, from this I can show that the diameter is bounded by four times k times i, right? So in each component, there is only a small number of columns where which differ, and otherwise all other components, uh, all other columns or coordinates for that component are always the same for all entries. Okay, but then we are kind of done, right? We, we just need to now show that if you, what do we need to do? If you pick some arbitrary vector v in some component, ah, this is just some mind that I said. If you pick some arbitrary vector v in some component and look at every other vector u, then you can use the fact that the diameter is bounded to show that because for each pair, v and u, only at most some function of r and k coordinates differ, um, the total number of coordinates that differ in that component are bounded by R and K. And all other coordinates must always be the same. Okay, good. So we can use this to just kernelize the number of columns as well and we get a real kernel. It's not polynomial, but it is a kernel. We bounded number of rows, bounded number of columns. We have to do something with these rows and columns, but just, that's just a little bit technical what you do with the rows, but it can be done. Okay, let me just conclude now. So what I showed was a two-step canalization for this uh, matrix clustering and completion, where we first reduce number of rows, then we reduce number of columns. We know there was, well, we, we, we have an idea for, sh is it written down? I think it's not written down, but we, we, we know how to show that it doesn't have polynomial kernels. And maybe it's interesting to think about what other problems make sense on this graph class, right, that arises from this, cluster, uh, for, from this clustering, right? <coughs> So like for instance, independence that corresponds to finding k outliers, like k things which are sufficiently far from each other. Um, and this is, I think, an interesting graph class. It, it contains cliques, subdivided cliques, 
but it still has enough structure to give us FPT algorithms for dominating set, for instance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I can send it to you. It's not on archive yet. Okay. It, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. You, Saket, you, I will. If, you, if anyone else wants it, just send me an email. <laughs>